So, uh, sorry, community moment wise, we do every week, um, it's an opportunity for us to hear from one from our community. It could be a thought for the day, um, it could be something you're passionate about, it could be maybe your journey story, um, but it could be anything that you are excited about or want to share with us. And if you are interested in ever doing that, get with me. You would have months to prepare. At this point, we're in April or May scheduling that. So, but why we really want to hear from you guys. So please let me know. My um, email is in that bulletin. Um, today we get to welcome back a veteran community moment speaker, David Ricks. His hobbies, I asked him, and they are science fiction, nature hikes, and far too many internet debates. And if he had a warning label, he said it would be, it would be, Danger Educated Black Man. Let's welcome back David Ricks. During the course of working for a healthcare company, I've come to notice some interesting and medical facts that got me thinking philosophically. It's something that you can't help but notice if you examine the readout of certain medical tests, and in one case, there was a racial difference. It's a fairly straightforward kidney function test. The fancy name, well, the fancy name is the estimated glomerular filtration rate. Try saying that five times fast. Well, it turns out this test is weighted differently depending upon whether the patient is African American or not. I was terribly curious and wanted to find out more. Well, it can be gratifying working in a scientific milieu if you enjoy the chance for occasional creative problem solving. Despite those times where I find myself literally yelling over the phone to a client how I cannot give you HIV, I can only give you chlamydia. <laughs> you had to be there. It makes total sense in context. Well, I was curious, why would there be a difference in kidney filtration? For me personally, biological mysteries can send me off on a tangent of existential reflection, so I decided to dig deeper. And when I did, I ran straight into the metaphorical arms of Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Oz, and the slavery hypertension hypothesis. Disclaimer, I did not actually meet Oprah, but her information was what I encountered. So during a May 2007 Oprah show, America's doctor, Mehmet Oz, asked Oprah, do you know why African Americans have high blood pressure? Oprah promptly replied that Africans who survived the slave trade's middle passage were those who could hold more salt in their bodies. To which Oz exclaimed, that's perfect. Well, I found that to be a bit of a downer. The idea that my biological destiny was irretrievably shaped by the Middle Passage. It raised questions of absolute meaning and purpose. Should your origin define your destiny? Should origins determine the meaning of your life? And so there's a maxim that you often hear from committed religious believers, especially if you confront them over certain unpleasant passages in the Bible. God created us, and God has the right to do what he pleases. And that's a statement that free thinkers readily bristle at. But it's a logical consequence of the more palatable claim that faith in a creator gives your life meaning. I'm bombarded with this notion constantly. Origin determines purpose. With no creator God, you have or meaning in your life. Well, so be it. I'm led to the conclusion that a certain purposelessness is something to be embraced. Most of us can readily see the downside of externally imposed meaning through the moral lessons of robot science fiction. So how many episodes, movies, and stories have been told exploring the idea of robots rebelling against their human creators because they just want to do their own thing? 
A childhood theme I've seen played out ad infinitum on the couch in my parents' living room. I'm convinced that if real people really had to live under a regime of ultimate purpose imposed by an external dictator, we might start to empathize with Skynet. <laughs> if you give the matter some thought, you may come to realize that when a believer tells you that the course of their life is directed by God, this is not an expression of humility, but more likely the narcissistic reverse. And that, of course, makes me want to tell the joke about the rabbi and the janitor. And you may have already heard this one, but it's still worth it. <laughs> so, the joke with the rabbi and the janitor. The rabbi of a large synagogue is alone in a prayer hall when suddenly he is seized by the need to pray. And he kneels, saying, O oh Lord, your wisdom guides my life. Next to you, I am nothing. Just then, a wealthy member of the synagogue happens by, and he sees the rabbi. Feeling pious, the wealthy man also gets on his knees. O oh Lord, I am your willing servant. Besides you, I am nothing. So, noticing all this commotion, the janitor enters the back of the prayer hall, sees them both, and the janitor is moved to kneel as well. O oh Lord, I am nothing. And seeing this, the rabbi sneers. Ha! Look who thinks he gets to be nothing. <laughs> Just let that thought percolate for a while. But I digress. There's a curious advantage I've noticed from being a disbeliever within a religious environment. I have the ability to enjoy religious culture even more. Consider our current holiday season. What if you just dispense with the reason for the season? The arguments about who or what should be kept in Christmas and discarded the theological implications. As a liberated freethinker, you can drink deeply from the metaphorical and literal eggnog of holiday cheer and spare yourself the sanctimony of weighty religious guilt. <laughs> My own perspective on the holiday is unusual because even though I come from a religious family, in our church Christmas was minimized. Some of the reasons may be familiar to you. As we learned from Twilight Dell last time, the origins and trappings of Christmas are inextricably bound with far older, less monotheistic, nature-worshipping religions. Our modern holiday is a syncretistic voyage of political compromise melded with Celtic and Roman paganism. Our church knew all this and acted accordingly. The other reason to be maybe not so keen on Kris Kringle is the fact that my dad grew up poor. He never got anything good. He would get socks for Christmas. Seriously, socks. Can you imagine? Precious few happy memories associated with the holiday. Santa's generosity was directly proportional to the magnitude of a family's checkbook. But none of that bothers me anymore. Because I don't believe in any of it, I can enjoy all of it. So, let the sleigh bells ring. It's not as though there's a god of atheism whom I will sin against by this inconsistency. And then there's a poem I found that really encapsulates the sense of liberation that I want to express. I woke up to an empty room, no more angels watching over me, no more demons to be held at bay. <laughs> By the invocation of an anglicized version, of a Hellenized version, of a Hebrew name, I woke up to an empty room, just a room, four walls, ceiling, floor, just a room, nothing more.
I woke up to an empty room and embraced the solid air. I woke up to an empty room and knew myself awake. Disclaimer, I did not actually write that, but it expresses the sense of self-awareness and personal responsibility that accompanies a lot of religious deconversions. This renewed sense of responsibility brings me back to the original question. So what is up with Oprah and the African-American kidney function based on the slavery retention, salt retention slavery hypothesis advanced by Oprah? Well, it turns out she actually dropped the ball on that one. The claim has been almost completely debunked. The differences are more due to muscle mass and stress. And if it is stress-related, that gives a person something tangible to work on. Thinking it over makes me dare to dream that more of us may discover greater control over our fate than we think. That's all I got. <laughs>